Good morning, this is Pastor Jason Bratcher, and welcome to Hartford Baptist Church. We're glad that you've decided to join us today in our time of worship unto Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, through singing of praise, sharing our tithes and our offerings, and the reading and preaching of the God-breathed Word of God. We invite you to come to our facility at 415 Liberty Street, Hartford, Kentucky, next to the Community Center. Our traditional service starts at 9 a.m., Blessed Academy, Sunday School, at 1015 a.m., and our contemporary service starts at 1115 a.m. The Kingdom Kids Ministry, or Children's Church, as well as our nursery is provided in our 1115 a.m. service. The registration table for those ministries is in our education wing and begins at 11 a.m. At Hartford Baptist Church, we're a community of grace, serving a community of needs. May God bless you through the services here today. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Hartford Baptist Church. Will you stand up as we worship God? The Bible tells us in Philippians to rejoice in the Lord. How often? It says rejoice in the Lord always. And that's what we do this morning. Rejoice in the glory of God. Good morning, church. Got a great day today. Two baptisms this morning. Is that a Green Bay Packers shirt? Mom? Oh, I said that right up here on that little store right there. You know I'm holding him underwater, right? But uh, Lincoln, was it last month? Two, yeah, last Monday, right? Not this past one before. Lincoln, have, for the last year or so, has been really exploring his, his heart and his mind, his soul on a relationship with Jesus. And just, just not too long ago, Lincoln submitted to the Lordship of Jesus. And today comes before us in baptism. Um, before, before I hold the Packer fan underwater, I do want to read some scripture. Uh, Mark chapter 10, verse 13. And they were bringing children to him, who's Jesus, that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus saw it, and he was diligent and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for such belongs to the sorry, such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them. This verse here. It's not talking about you need to be, no, eight years old to come to Jesus. But you need to come with the faith that Lincoln has. And you can see that in Lincoln when it comes to his parents. Lincoln has that trust, that faith, that dependency on his parents and his family. That's how we come to Jesus. We come trusting and depending on him. We're saying, I can't do life on my own. I need you to be my dad. And that's what Lincoln has done. Story on whenever seconds after Lincoln finished praying his first prayer as a Christian to Jesus, um, he jumps up to run away, and Mom grabs him and says, "Where are you going? I just want to hug." And he's still trying to push away and wiggle free. He's like, "I gotta tell Sawyer." So Lincoln has that excitement of having Jesus in his life, and he just couldn't wait to tell someone about it. And hopefully, we can share in that and keep Lincoln encouraged in that excitement as he pursues his discipleship with Jesus. 
So Lincoln Lanham, you ready for this boy? All right. Lincoln, do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? Yes. Do you believe Jesus died on the cross for your sins and rose three days later? Yes. Do you trust in Jesus alone for eternal salvation? Yes. Green's going ahead, yeah. And, and by the grace of God, do you intend to be his disciple, living out his word and trying to be like him? All right. Then Lincoln, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay. All right, buddy. Okay. And many of you probably recognize Angel who's walking down. Angel's been with us for several weeks now. And since week number, just sit right there and face Carmela. Since the first day I met her, she was highly inquisitive of Jesus and God and had great understanding. And you could tell she was searching for something. And I think she found what she was looking for, didn't you? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, at the beginning of Mark, Mark chapter 1, when John the Baptist is on the scene, he's baptizing. He says, I baptize you with water, but the guy coming after me, he's going to baptize you in spirit. And that's what our water baptism symbolizes. Whenever Angel and Lee can go under the water, it's symbolizing that internal reality in their life. That they have died to sin and risen to new life. They are washed clean by the blood of Jesus. And they are now part of his family. Yes. Are you ready? Angel, do you believe Jesus was the Son of God? Yes, I do. Or is, I said, I said was, is the Son of God, but same answer. Yes, I do. do you believe Jesus died on the cross for your sins and rose three days later? Yes, I do. Do you trust in Jesus alone for the hope of salvation and eternal life? Yes, I do. By God's grace, do you tend to be his disciple and live out his world? Yes, I do. All right. Well, I know what you're first. Then, Angel, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay. Brother David, can you take us to prayer, sir? My name is Husuo Daniel Tarnagda and uh, I'm from West Africa, the ministry that we work with is called Refuge Bowling Green. So I was living and working overseas when I met Daniel and uh, when we moved to America, we came straight to Bowling Green. I got a job here locally and when Daniel came, he came up with the idea of starting a soccer program where he could connect with other African young men and then also be able to impact and connect with their families. Here at Refuge, our main goal it is in three different areas, occupation, recreation, and education. All those three main parts it is to help the refugees to be self-sufficient and to make sure that they know Christ at the same time. A refugee is a person who had no choice about fleeing their country. Um, they, in general, most of the refugees that we work with spent about 20 years in a refugee camp before being resettled by the UN. Um, and they have no say in which country they go to. Um, and so much of the decisions in their lives are not their decisions. Someone else is making those decisions for them. One story come to, my, to mind, it is a young man uh, named Kashindi. Uh, Kashindi lost mom and dad and brother and sister. And only him and his little brother survived. They spent more than 20 years in a camp with a foster parent. 
So when they arrived here, Kashini had so many problems, stomach. So he was throwing up a lot, stomach pain, and he could not even go to school or go to work. And when he went to see the doctor, and it was very bad inside. And one night he called us, say, I can't bear this pain no more. I think I need to take my life. And we told him, we are going to be your family. And we spent time with him through prayer, through fasting. Kashini had a job, and now he doesn't have Medicaid no more. He's self-sufficient. He bought his first car. And Kashini got baptized. We celebrate his baptize a couple of months ago. And his brother, brother is on the same path of wanting to be baptized. They want a country to belong to. They haven't had that. They don't have that. We are so thankful for the Eliza Bronis offering this total transformation and impact in the lives of, of immigrants and refugees. Would not be possible without the Eliza Bronis offering. How many of you believe in coincidences? I believe God has a purpose in every one of our lives. And he had a purpose in my life yesterday. I was blessed to be able to go to Lewis Lane Baptist and hear, uh, well, I went to hear Pat Howard. She's in charge of all the refugees in Bowling Green. Well, Pat brought along a young lady I didn't know at the time. Guess who it was? It was Alice this video. It's wonderful listening to her. Gosh, it just touched my heart so much. Because let me, you know, like she said, a refugee is a person who has been forced to leave, not chosen, but forced to leave their country in order to escape war, persecution, or national disaster. You know, when you stop and think about it, uh, we have several people in the United States that are refugees. Look at all the, the floods and the hurricanes and the tornadoes and everything that hits. And they've had to move, not because they wanted to. So they are a refugee. There's a lot of refugees in our Bible, in the Bible, and uh, Abraham, but the most significant one to me our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, y'all look that up and see how many refugees you can find in the Bible. You'll be surprised. Alice, so interesting in letting us know there are so many refugees in the United States. This, the year of uh, 2019, there was 30,000 that came in. And uh, that's huge. And that's huge. They are brought in, and they have six weeks to learn English. How many of y'all can learn a new language in six weeks? I'm still learning English. Uh, and then within seven months, they have to receive their citizenship before they go back. That's right. They lose all their support. So when they come, they do have a stipend that they get each month. And they also um, do have a place to live. They do not have jobs. They have to earn the right to have a job. They have to be able to communicate, and that's why they have to have English learn first. So. Um, a lot of interesting facts, and her husband, Daniel, was so convicted that he wanted to touch, like the teenage above, young men. Because, you know, I know a lot of people work with the smaller age groups and all, but that age group gets left out sometimes. So he was so convicted to work with these, so that he felt like using them as a and having a soccer team would be an excellent way, and it was. They started out with 25 on their team, 
now he has four teams of 25. And they have an international soccer league that yesterday they met. I didn't get to meet Daniel yesterday, but yesterday they met and had, you know, games for, and gave out trophies. So they are working so diligently with the refugees. So my, my heart is so full, and I'm burdened so much with the need of helping missionaries. Our church goal, our church goal is $1,200 for the lives of Christ. Just like Alice said, they couldn't do a lot of things. They didn't have the lives of Christ. Church, I'm asking you to please dig deep. Dig deep. Uh, I, I pray we'll meet our goal, but at least I want God to lead you into sharing what you can so that these missionaries can stay on and do their job. They are struggling. They struggle. They don't have the luxuries we have every day. So let's, let's pray about it and, and, and try to give as much as we possibly can. It's just not the month of September. We can give any time, but uh, that's our emphasis this month of September. So as we uh, pray about it, give what you can. Father God, I just come to you today, and I thank you, Lord, for this church. I thank you, Lord, that we have a heart for missions in this church. Lord, I ask that you just touch each and every heart here today and, and lay it upon their heart as to what they can get. And Lord, I know there's a lot of times we buy things or eat out or do whatever and spend money that we could be giving to help others. Lord, I just pray for the missionaries today, Alice and Daniel and, and Pat. And I just pray, Lord, that you will be with them, guard them, and protect them, and help them do their ministry. Lord, I just ask that you take this money we are giving in our offerings and tithes and use it to whatever needs you see fit that we should do. For all these beautiful people here, and for our new Baptists and new Christians and new brothers and sisters in Christ, these things we ask in your name. Jesus, Messiah, Redeemer, Emmanuel, all the beautiful names of our Savior. Will you stand as we praise Him?
church. I am not Pastor Jason. If you haven't met before, my name is Jonathan McCreed, youth pastor, Hartford Baptist Church. Jason is giving Crystal a vacation. For first service, she gave a testimony how good it was and how much stuff she's got done. Now, she's had a good week now. Um, but no, our, our pastor is in, a, he is with the Navajo Indians. Um, they probably got him to work building something physical. Now, I don't know if it's working on the church, but, but he is teaching the Navajo Christian leaders the book of James. So he's, he's equipping the, the trainers over there. Yes, that is deserve applause. <laughs> Out there doing missions. Um, but we have been, this is uh, week four of our series on 1 Corinthians. Um, last week, uh, Jason started looking at divisions in the Corinthian church. We're going to kind of detour from that today. Paul, Paul gets on a it's not quite the rabbit hole, but he's kind of on a tangent a little bit. But he's going to get back on the divisions that are in the church of Corinth. But what Paul is going to clarify today, he's going to help us see why the church of Corinth has so many issues. But just to kind of remember where Jason was, the very last word, verse, sorry, that brother Jason read uh, last week was uh, verse 17, chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross be emptied of its power. The topics wisdom and cross is a focus on the passage that we're going to read today. And Paul's just smooth as can be transitioned into this. The, we're going to explore what the cross meant to Corinth. You know, we think we know what the cross means because it means something to us. It didn't mean that to the city of Corinth. It had, whenever they seen a physical cross their reaction would be much different than what ours is today. And wisdom, they had their own view of wisdom as well. And those will be things that we're going to be talking about. But before we dive in, and not only is this going to help us understand this uh, passage today, but it's going to help us understand the rest of the letter to the Corinthians, I want to explore the city of Corinth itself. Uh, the city as, Cor Corinth as Paul knows it was founded by Julius Caesar about a hundred years after Rome burned it down. As Rome was on their conquest and building their empire, Corinth got in the way. The Greeks got in the way. But uh, Strabo, Greek historian Strabo, tells us that Julius Caesar predominantly, he colonized Corinth with freedmen. That's ex-slaves. People who had earned or bought their freedom. And Rome was getting so big, he needs, Caesar needs some place to put all these freedmen. And so Corinth is the city I will send them to. And the freedmen were excited because in Rome was very, um, the word oligarchy comes to mind, but they are very stru society structured. Once you were born into a level of society, if you were a peasant, you will die a peasant. That's your lot in life. If you're rich and you're noble, that's the way you are. That's the way you were born into. And that's how Rome was. Well, this, the freedmen seen an opportunity to make something of themselves. Much like many of the immigrants coming to America, they came for the opportunity to better themselves. So these freedmen in Corinth as the opportunity to advance themselves socially, education-wise, wealth. But Corinth, 
quickly would become that oligarchy they fled. The few freedmen who gained wealth suppressed the rest from gaining it. First guy to open shop kept the rest from opening a competing shop. They became elitists, the, adopting the very Roman system that once oppressed them. I miscited who says, but Alciphron, who was a second century writer, he visited Corinth once, said he'll never be back, and this is why he said he'd never go back to Corinth. I learned in a short time the nauseating behavior of the rich and the misery of the poor. Corinth had become divided between the haves and the have-nots. They were actually worse than the system they left. There was no known place in the Roman Empire where society was divided as severely as Corinth. Historians also tell us that during the time, if you look in the book of Acts, when Paul visited Corinth, between that time and the time he wrote this letter, Corinth was going through a great famine. So that made the divide between the haves and the have-nots of Corinth even that much worse. This also explains, well I won't go there yet. Status was tied to your occupation, your wealth, your education, knowledge, religious purity, your family, your ethnic background. That all determined your status in Corinth. Well, I could read you those same things now and say that's what determines your status in the United States of America. Education, wealth, ethnic background. This applies to us today. Each of these attributes was weighed differently depending on the group who weighed them. I mean by that, Corinth would have what they would call reciprocity conventions. It's where I would meet with a group of my friends and other people meet with a group of their friends and we would kind of form a gang or a union so to speak where we would try to outposition or get the wealth that this group had. And we looked out for each other and we would metaphorically or maybe even literally cut the throats of our enemies. It was a dog eat dog world. Everybody had their clique. Everybody had their gang. Which explains what Jason read to us last week. The church of Corinth was already subdividing. You had the groups that followed Paul. You had the group of Paul, the group of Peter, the group of Jesus, the group of Apollos. Everybody was dividing up into their cliques in the church. Because that's what society did. You got into your close group of friends to survive. They fought for everything they had. They were always chasing wealth. The, 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 the honor, the glory. That's what they were chasing in Corinth. And that's what they started doing in the church. And that's what Brother Jason started telling us about last week. This attitude is going to color everything we read in this letter. The church of Corinth had a lot of issues and it was because they embraced the culture or the attitude of Corinth. We need to get, we need to work, we need to get more stuff. We need the education, we need the money. And they were driven in that manner. And even in today, we see the culture affecting our church in many different ways. One thing, I was recently having a conversation with Becca. We have, there's church service, worship services now that have brought climate change into the worship service. One, they started praying with plants and or watching an ice cube melt and kind of praying for the ice cube and God to end global warming. Um, and then they, they had brought in uh, other ones were a fantaside. The, the killing of babies who are born. There's been churches to pray to legalize that. And that's hard to imagine, but they're out there. And these are ways that the culture just is kind of changing the attitude of the church. Where once we've had that trust in God, now we're just trying to do things on our own. But P Paul tells us in Ephesians that the world follows the prince of the power of the air, and that's Satan. And since the world reflects their prince... It seems to be, kind of reflect that their, their wisdom is going to reflect their prince. Jesus uses a different term in John 8, 44. He says, you are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desire. The culture is not our friend. The culture's father, their prince, is Satan. The will is to do his desire. Now, sometimes it can look really good that the ways of the world, that looks really good. I think I can make that work. I can't even make that work in church. The climate is important. You know, we don't want to destroy our planet. We're stewards of the earth. We should be taking care of it, and that's true. But whenever we elevate plants to a level in a worship service where our prayers are directed to them, we're, we're, we've done something wrong there. Our 
Our scripture today, we're still in chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians. We're going to start in verse 18. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and in the discernment of the discerning, I will tort. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand a sign and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you are wise according to worldly standards. Not many of you were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low, God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring to the things that are, to bring to nothing the things that are. So that no human human might boast in the presence of God. And because of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us the wisdom of God, righteousness, sanctification and redemption so that as it is written let no one who boasts boast in let, let the one who boasts boast in the Lord may the Lord bless the reading of his word let's let's go to God in prayer heavenly father we thank you so much for the blessing of this nation that we have we, it's the greatest nation in the world I have no doubt of that Lord you have blessed us immensely but I ask that you use this passage here to open our eyes and let us not be like Corinth there's a warning here and that the, the world does not need to enter the church, Lord. Do, do not let us be corrupted by society. Use this scripture. Send your Holy Spirit upon us to open our minds, open our hearts. Speak through us so that we may avoid the errors that the others have committed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm. I get tongue-tied when my mouth gets dry. Oh. All right. Verse 18 tells us there's two types of people in the world. In my youth who have been to the, our study in Revelation, heard me say this, I don't know how many times, because it's made very clear in Revelation, but Paul makes it clear here. Two types of people in the world. Those who are perishing and those who are being saved. What distinguishes between those two types of people is how they view the word of the cross. Now you probably guessed already that the word of the cross is the gospel. And you're, and you're mostly correct there. Um, the, the, that is part of the gospel. But Paul is focusing on that cross. He could have said, we preach the word of the gospel. I preach Christ resurrected. But he said the word cross. And we may read that and not think anything of it. But the people in Co Corinth would. He wanted to emphasize the cross. And we're going to explore, ask, why did he do that? Why did he need to do that? Today the cross is, a, is, a, is the symbol of the church. We've got it hung up everywhere. We probably put it on, we wear the jewelry, we got the t-shirts, and not even the church, but the secular world will put on cross earrings, cross necklaces, have cross tattoos. You'll see that in the secular world, especially in this nation. But in the days of Paul, especially in Corinth, the cross was very highly offensive. To die on the cross was not only extremely slow and painful, but the public stigma, the, the, the disgracefulness of being hung on the cross was so bad, it was against the Roman law to kill a Roman by crucifixion. That was unacceptable capital punishment in, in, for a Roman. You had, they did it to foreigners and slaves, but they never did it to a Roman citizen because that's how, how barbaric and dis disrespectful that crucifix crucifixion was looked at. Cicero writes this to his fellow Roman citizens. He says, The very word of the cross should be far removed, not only from a Roman citizen's eyes, sorry, his thoughts, but his eyes and ears as well. So for us to preach, for the church of Corinth to preach, for Paul to preach, that a Jewish man for some insignificant part of the empire 
a divine being sent to earth, God in the flesh, the ancient of days, Lord of lords, and that he purposely died on a cross would have made him laugh. How could someone so high, someone so per the most powerful being on the, in the universe, how could he die on the cross? That is the lowest form of execution there is. There's nothing more disgraceful that we could do to you. They couldn't accept that God would do that to himself. The people of Corinth were in that daily struggle for power, wealth, honor. And, you wanted, and Paul wanted to tell them that the most powerful being in existence died on that cross. And Paul said basically that the scripture is folly to them. They couldn't understand why Jesus, if he is God in flesh, why he would, why he, how he even could do that. But to those of us being saved, the cross makes absolute sense. We know why he did it. We see the love. We see the purpose. And we stand before God with a repentant heart and we praise him for the work he did. C.S. Lewis writes, How one responds to the cross reveals where they will be heading, to immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. You may notice in verse 18 where the ESV translation I read said, They are being saved. And he says, And they are perishing. But normally we talked about when we're saved, we're saved. Now Lincoln, go, Lincoln can rightfully say, I am saved by Jesus, by the blood of the Lamb. But Paul also can rightfully say Lincoln is being saved still. And the reason Paul can do that is because of how he looks at salvation. In chapter 15 of this same letter, he's going to show us the completion of that salvation is during Jesus' second coming. Because when you think about now, even though we're forgiven of our sin, we're redeemed from our sin, we still sin, we still live in a fallen world, death is still occurring, the world is still an, an awful place at times. So until that... that Jesus' Jesus second coming, everything is reconciled to him and made perfect, Paul still likes to use that term being saved. Because that, it's not 100% complete until Jesus' second coming. When Christ returns, all things will be subjected to him. The bride, which is the church, will be given to him. And, the, the, and those who are perishing are cast into hell. Verse 19, Paul quotes the Greek version of the Old Testament Bible, Isaiah 29, 14, where God declares that the, he's going to make the worldly wise look like fools. In fact, Paul already says he did. God's not declaring that wi all wisdom will be destroyed. He's not saying all wisdom is bad. Paul's not saying that either. And as we're going to see later on this passage, there's really two types of wisdom in play here. Verse 20 says, where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Paul uses three professional terms for experts. The, the Greek word for wise there is sophos, which is just to be kind of the, to be the expert of your field. It doesn't necessarily mean that wise man, even though that's what Paul's talking about here. But you have, you are highly skilled in a specific trade. The second word is scribe. We know that from the, the New Testament, the Gospels, right? Jesus was always interacting with the scribes. Those are the guys who were masters of the law. The last term, zuzetetes, is a Greek word that basically means these are the debaters, not bad, but skilled philosopher. These would be the PhDs of the Roman time. And to me, that, that third word kind of adds to the previous two. What Paul is saying in this passage is, send your brightest, send me the educated Greek, send me the, the, the studied Jew, and God will make their wisdom look foolish. God has made their wisdom look foolish in the eyes of the believer. Verse 21, this one can be a little tricky, but we're going to use the commas as our friend here. The ESV puts them in a good spot for us. But for sense in the wisdom of God... We got that comma there. We got for wisdom number one, wisdom of God. The second one's coming up. The world did not know God through wisdom. We don't necessarily know what, who was, what wisdom that is. Is that talking about the wisdom of God or is that talking about another wisdom? And to me, that wisdom, it's not God's wisdom. It, it is the world's wisdom. As he's going, context is going to make clear. You do not get to know God through your own wisdom. You can't know enough stuff. You can't teach yourself self about God enough to have that saving relationship with him. You can know of him, 
But without God's wisdom, you can't be saved. Worldly wisdom is incapable of understanding the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God is in, incomprehensible to the world. Knowing God has nothing to do with your intellect or your knowledge about him. And a, and a prime example of this is Matthew chapter 16 verses 15 through 17. In, in this scripture here, Jesus is asking, Who do people say I am? And the disciples get the various answers. Then he says, Who do you say I am? And Peter answers on behalf of the, the disciples and says, He says, You are the Christ. The Son of God. And Jesus' response was, Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but the Father in heaven. Jesus could have said, I revealed that to you, because Jesus is teaching him all this stuff. Jesus could say, Hey, Peter, good job of listening to me. I revealed that to you. But he didn't say that. He said, The Father in heaven revealed that to you. This passage here makes it clear, unless God reveals to us who Jesus is, no human can make us understand who Jesus really is. You can sit at the feet of Billy Graham, as good an evangelist as he was, you can sit there day after day after day, listen to Billy Graham preach the gospel, but if the Father doesn't reveal who Jesus is to you, you will never accept him as God. God has to be involved in the process. But notice, it pleases God that we preach this folly. Paul's saying we still have to preach. Even though salvation's 100% of God, we still have a job to do. And that is to preach, as Paul says, the folly, which that is the gospel. And we'll come back to that word folly here in a minute. We have a job to do. But luckily, because God does his job perfectly, we just have to do ours. Now, Matthew, go, make disciples of all men. Baptizing, teach them to do all the things I've taught you. We just got to do that. God will, take, God will do his job perfectly. Isaiah 55, 11, he says, My word will accomplish what I've sent it out to do. We just have to share the word. God will do the hard stuff. Verses 22 and 24, Paul focuses on the reasons of the objections of the scribe and the wise men, the Jew and the Greek. The Jews want a sign, Paul says. And that is true. If you've read the Gospels, Jesus performed miracle after miracle in the New Testament. And what did the Jews always want? More signs. Now there's one sign where Jesus filled, it says the 5,000 men. Jesus feeds 5,000 men. Does the same thing about women and children. So that number could have been 10,000, could have been 20,000. But there was 5,000 men regardless. And he fed them with two fish, five loaves of bread. That's a tremendous sign. That's a tremendous miracle. And there was leftovers, I believe, to that miracle. Well, so anywhere from 10 to 20,000 people fed with that little food. Huge miracle. The very next day, those, that same group of people come up to Jesus and go, Jesus, what sign will you perform that we may believe that you are who you say you are? I would have loved to see Jesus' face. It's like, did you, did you not pay attention yesterday? I just fed thousands of people with two fish and five loaves and now you're asking me to perform a sign so I can prove who I am? I just did it. And then of course in the Gospel of John he makes it clear that no sign is going to change anything. And certainly it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't today too. If Jesus was here performing signs, they would just want Jesus to perform more signs. It's not going to change who they believe he is if God the Father is not involved. The Greeks in their con constant quest of wisdom and their understanding of God's and the cross, and weakness, and wealth, and honor. They just could not understand how God could sink so low to die on that cross. Why would he do it? It's, it's folly to them. There's no logical reason in their mind that God would have to die to save us. There could have been another way. There's, you know, there, there's, there's something else that would have happened. This can't be true. Of course, for the believer, we understand why it had to happen. Why Jesus had to shed his blood for us and die for us. And it makes perfect sense to us. But to a lost world trusting in their own wisdom, it's folly. And to make things even more confusing for the Jews and the Greek, you got that passage in Deuteronomy that says, you know, the one who's hanged from a tree is cursed by God. And that threw the Jews and the Greeks for a loop. Your own scripture says he was cursed. How could God curse? Well, no, it couldn't be God. They couldn't see why. But to those who are called, 
Christ crucified is the power and wisdom of God. Verse 25, Paul says, The foolishness of God is wiser than men. And I would have to do the scare quotes when Paul says foolishness. Because Paul does, Paul's not saying anything about God is foolish. He's not saying anything about God's weak. That's what they are saying about the cross. So Paul's saying, this thing you call foolishness, this thing you call weak, it is wiser and stronger than anything you can send in God's path. Anything you can bring up, this weakness, this self, what you perceive as weakness is stronger than what you got. Just to give you an example how this culture of Paul's era just mocked the crucifixion. The oldest image that, that we know of Jesus is a plaster engraving. And the inscription says, Alexamonos worships his God. And there's a Roman soldier with his hands up in front of a cross worshiping. And Jesus is on the cross. But the head of Jesus is replaced by the head of a donkey. That's the attitude they had. That's what they believed it was. It was foolishness. No real God, no Messiah, no Savior would end up on the cross. And that's how they portrayed Christianity. Worshipping a donkey-headed Savior. And that's the attitude of Corinth. That's the attitude of the world. That's the attitude of some in the world today. Today, across the world, Christianity is still mocked as complete and utter foolishness by some of the smartest people on the planet. Intellectually, they can do physic problems like nobody's business. But they think this, the, cro the cross, utter foolishness. Verses 26 and 28, that's all one big long sentence to Paul here. But Paul says, God chose what is foolish, God chose what is weak, God chose what is low, God chooses the that are nots. Many translations like to add the word things here. Low things, weak things, foolish things. The things that are not. The CSB drops the word things. And the reason they do it is because things is not in the Greek. There's no word there for things. The ESV only uses things once. Miss Polly, I believe, is carrying the Passion Translation with her. Her translation makes it clear that Paul's talking about people, not things. And I agree with all three of those translations. He's not talking about things. He's talking about the people. And the reason, another reason I believe that, these are all four of those terms were commonly used phrases of the plebeian class, the, the commoners of the Roman Empire. You would describe the common folk with all four of those terms. They are low. They are weak. They are foolish. They are nothing. But Paul says God chose them. He, the people you say are low and weak. God chose them. And he had a purpose for that. And why did he choose them? Because he wanted to shame the wise of the world. He wanted to show the strong that they're truly weak. The priorities of the world are not the priorities of God. He wanted to show the people of Corinth, the people of the world, that everything you're chasing for does not matter. We've all heard you can't take your money to heaven with you. But yet a lot of us still chase money. We chase the car, we chase the houses, we chase the boys and the girls. And we don't take any of it with us. And the reason God is choosing the low, the weak, the poor, the have-nots, or the nothings, sorry, is because he wants to shame those who chased after things they shouldn't have chased. Another reason he does it so no man or woman can boast in their salvation or wisdom in God. Verses 29 to 31, I'm going to read that again. So that no human being might boast in the presence of God, and because of him you are in Christ. I'm going to read that again. And because of him you are in Christ, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Paul further, further develops this idea in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one may boast. Here Paul is making it clear. The gift, of, the, gift the unmerited gift, what God gives you, is saved through faith. It is salvation through faith. That is the gift of God. That is what he gives freely and willingly. In Philippians 1.29, Paul says, For it has been granted to you 
that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but you should also suffer for his sake. Folks, on granted to you that you should not only believe. This is just what Jesus told Peter. That you, flesh, your own wisdom did not reveal this to you. God the Father has to grant it to you. Worldly wisdom cannot save you. We cannot save ourselves. Nothing we do is going to save us. Only God can do that. And God needs to give us that godly wisdom that is needed for salvation. God chose this path so no man or woman could boast. We can't say we chose God because we're special or we figured something out. Peter couldn't say it. Church of Philippians can't say it. Corinth can't say it. We can't say it. We didn't figure anything out on our own. God the Father granted it to us. Stephen Hawking, the late Stephen Hawking, he's passed away not too long ago, infinitely smarter than I could ever be in my life. I could study physics to the end and never even have a fraction of his knowledge. But Stephen, Stephen Hawking was a physicist and an atheist, and he was, he was key in promoting the idea, even in our school system, of the Big Bang Theory. You know, that there was nothing, there was just this dense mass of particles, and something happened, hit it, and boom, everything's created. Stephen Hawking believed that. He taught that. He promoted that. Well, the Christian, well, we don't necessarily disagree with that, Stephen, because there was nothing, and then all of a sudden, there's something. And we'd say, God spoke, let there be light. You know, things happen. But, and, and Stephen realized his problem, because he got, he got caught up in his own law of cause and effect. Okay, he got the effect. The effect was the Big Bang Theory, but what caused the Big Bang? The Christian goes, God caused the Big Bang. God pre-existed. He caused the Big Bang. Stephen Hawking, though, no, that can't be. I'm missing something. Two weeks before he died, he gave his theory. He said there was a thing called, I'm gonna call it, this is his term, I didn't, I'm insulting, this is what he called it, imaginary time. He goes, this is where time kind of went vertically. And it was a different substance. The material world that we know didn't exist. Matter and everything was completely different. And then all of a sudden something happened and matter kind of transformed. It bursted out of this unknown immaterial world and it exploded into the material in the Big Bang and that's where creation came from. And the Christian goes, oh, you're right, Stephen. That, what you call imaginary time, that realm of immaterial matter that didn't exist, but then all of a sudden change of matter did, we call that the spiritual world. That's where God is. So even in Stephen's, all his physics, his brilliant mind, he comes up with all these theories, and none of it contradicts the Bible, and he's so close. But he just can't connect it. He couldn't connect it. And he couldn't see his very own theories were justifying the existence of God. As smart as he was, he just couldn't get it. The, wi the worldly wisdom cannot get us there, no matter how much we have. I'm saved by God. If your faith is in Jesus, you are saved by God, not because of anything you do. As, as the song that Brother Jason loves, we didn't earn it, we didn't deserve it. It was granted to us by God for his glory. Rebecca, you can come, you guys come up and go ahead and get ready. T to close it out, now we, we begin exploring Corinth's divide. Where worldly wisdom, the, 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 the chase of life, them trying to gain wealth and knowledge and honor, getting educated. Don't we do that in America? We send our kids to college to get a four-year degree for, and they don't even know what they want to do. But that's what you do in America. You go get a college and you get that, get that four-year degree. We chase the education. We chase the money. Get the good job. Get the good spouse. That's life. But are we, are we doing what Corinth did? Are we chasing the wrong thing? Not that college is bad. Don't take it that way. But we, and the, for the most part, we put more priority with our kids on college than we do with Christ. We've embraced the world's wisdom. Miss Peggy got up and she talked about all of the refugees. And, and that storyline, it, it reminds me of Corinth and it reminds me of the, the, the founding of this nation. No, our, we were all refugees. Our descendants were refugees here who came to better themselves. They worked hard, pulled themselves up by the bootstraps and they earned some of them tremendous wealth and prosperity in this nation. That's what Corinth did. That's what those freedmen did. But they lost sight of what was important and they became the very thing they once hated. 
they adopted the Roman system and they began oppressing the poor. They began oppressing the other refugees. And, and Peggy was talking about refugees. She's not talking about illegal immigrants. That's a total separate topic. The refugees have came here. They were placed here with expectations of learning the language, of getting jobs. And they've said, I'm going to do that. I'm going to become part of your society and contribute. But do we support them? Or do we, or do we turn our back on the refugees and oppress them like Corinth did the people in its city? And we, we, we've been here. We've got our wealth. Are we sharing it? Or are we just oppressing others and keeping our wealth? Are we chasing that new car? Are we chasing the new dress, the rings? Are we chasing the worldly things because that's what the worldly wisdom tells us to do? Or are we doing things to help the oppressed? Now Peggy gave us a great opportunity today to contribute to the Eliza Broadus. And they are literally in Bowling Green, not too far away, helping hundreds of refugees who have came here to learn the language, to have a better life. And we've got a good opportunity to do that. To not be like Corinth, but to be as God intends us to be. To have that godly wisdom where we, care, where we love our neighbor as ourselves. But what do, we, what do we usually do, church? I don't know the answer for you personally. But when I look at my life and how much money me and my wife have spent on vacations and houses and whatever, whatever it may be, did, I, did we need all that stuff? Could I have even took $100 of it and, you know, to go to Eliza Broadus? What, could they, what would those missionaries do with that? Teach somebody to learn English so they can stay in this country and work? I just pray, my prayer for us, church, is that we haven't lost our way. That we embrace the wisdom of God and not the wisdom of the world. Because the world can sneak into the church and you don't even know it's there. As Brother Jason keeps taking us through the letter of Corinth, Paul's bringing up things they didn't even realize they were doing. There's sin everywhere in the church and they're blind to it because they adopted the culture of the city they lived in. They divided themselves within the church. They divided themselves between the haves and the have-nots. And they're blind to their own sin. So I pray that we aren't blinded to our own sin. That we don't divide ourselves between the haves and the have-nots. If you have that wisdom of God, if you know that Jesus died on that cross for your sins, and that your trust and your love is in Him, but you haven't made that, you haven't made that public. God tells us we are to, or Paul tells us in Romans, we're to confess with our mouths. It's a command for us. So if you haven't made that proclamation, if you haven't made that confession that Jesus is my Lord, just like Lincoln and Angel, we trust in Him alone for eternal salvation. If you haven't made that public, but you're there in your heart and your mind and you know that, today make it that day where you make that confession. The author is also open as well for any other burden on your heart. The author is open at this time.
Thank you once again for joining us here today in worship at Hartford Baptist Church. We here at Hartford Baptist Church are a community of grace, serving a community of needs through Christ our Lord. Join us on our website at hartfordbaptistchurch.org or call us at 270-298-3701. Sunday morning worship is at 9 and 11.15 a.m. Sunday evening children's church from 4 to 5.30 p.m. and Wednesday night Bible study for our adults, children's ministry, as well as our youth meet at 6.30 p.m. Church bus transportation is provided for all of these. Please call 270-287-3700. Zero one to set up a pickup for our church van. Have a blessed week and may the joy of the Lord shine round and about you.